Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race Walk, and it is time for our weekly Bible study. And today we are going over the last chapter, the very end of the book of Job, Job chapter 42. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race Walk. And then I upload two videos a week. I upload a replay of that Bible study with some study aids as well as a video about books. So if you're interested in either of those things, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you get updates about new videos. But anyway, we are finally at the end of the book of Job. I cannot tell you how excited I am about this. And this is chapter 42 that we're gonna be going over today. But if you've missed all of the rest of the lessons or missed a few of them and haven't been through every chapter, you can go to my website at racewalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. I have a page there that lists all of the studies I've done. And then you can click on the page for the book of Job and it will have a list of everything. Before we get started, let's just start this time with a prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word and for your goodness and your grace to us. And we invite in the presence of your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. I plead the blood of Jesus over each person that listens, give us eyes that can see you clearly, give us ears that can hear your voice, and give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. Lord, I rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Job 42. Now, I am going to do a little bit of a recap because this is actually a short chapter. So the passage that we're going to be going over is not that long, but there's a lot of meat to it. A lot of things that are brought up in the chapter, a lot of things that you kind of need to consider. And so I'm going to be going over a recap of what we've got over so far. So we began this Bible study with an introduction to the book of Job and how the book of Job we discussed like uh, the debates on dating. We discussed how the book of Job fit into the literary format of the time. And we discussed that it's as the oldest book in the Bible. So it was actually, according to the I thought of a lot of scholars, it was, it's the oldest written book. It predates the writing of the book of law. And this book is all about the problem of evil and the question that it addresses is why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God allow this? This is a question that the oldest book in the Bible asks. And so the entire rest of the Bible, you can look at it as a response to that question. Why did this happen? Why is this happening? Why are we in the situation that we're in right now? And that's what Job was asking. He's like, this is a mess. Why did this happen to me? How many of us are in that same situation today? Yeah. Anyway, at the beginning of the book of Job, we meet Job and we find out he is the wealthiest man in the area. He has all this influence um, from some of the things that are mentioned in the other chapters. It seems like he was born into this affluence. He's had a pretty good life. But he's been a good steward of what he's been given. And he, that he's a righteous man who fears God. He's always making sacrifices for his family in case they've done any unintentional sins. And so he's doing what is he can to honor God. And then we're given a glimpse of what's kind of going on behind the scenes. So we saw the conversation between God and Satan. And Satan is basically challenging God and saying, the only reason that Job is serving you is because you've blessed him and you have so protected him that I can't even touch him. And that is the only reason that he is following you. And if you take that from him, he's going to curse you. You just watch and see. So God, in a sense, appoints Job as his champion. Right. So in a way, this is kind of also a foreshadowing of Christ in this way, like Jesus as a suffering servant. You know, Job is this he's going through these trials to prove the the honor and the glory of God. Right. Even though he doesn't know this, he didn't choose this knowingly like Jesus did. He is kind of a foreshadowing of Jesus in that way. It's like a type. Right. And God's saying that Job will prove Satan wrong. He's 
making a man his champion, this human being. Okay. So then the series of calamities hits Job. And we talked about in some of the other Bible studies that it was, you know, God's protection that was protecting Job from all these other calamities. And so when he holds himself back, this is what happens. And so everything is taken from Job, his wealth, his family, he's hit in every single area. And God told Satan he couldn't touch Job's life. He affected his health, but he couldn't touch his life, right? And so Job lost his entire family and his health, but his wife was still alive because she had lost all her children. She's like, just curse God and die. You know, what else is left for you? So even his own self is kind of turning away from him because his wife, you know, is like the two are made one, right? So anyway, I think that was the, that uh, covenant bond was a protection for her, but it was also like another sort of, um, another trial for him. And so he can't sleep. He has, he's in this miserable state of health and his mind is tormented. So in every single area, Job has taken a hit all at once. This, just this deluge of devastation. And all this takes place by chapter two in a book that's 42 chapters. So if we were writing this book, this would be probably like midway, right? Midway to a little bit further through if you're looking at a regular story arc. So in chapter three, Job expresses his grief and his confusion. He doesn't understand why this has happened to him. He is in the dark night of the soul and he just doesn't even see any hope for him or any way out in his life, right? He just thinks it's all over. And so chapters four through 25 are a back and forth between Job and his friends. And his friends initially come to comfort him, right? And then they start, uh, after Job has just starts talking, they're giving their opinion about what they think the problem is and why this happened. And, you know, as we discussed in throughout these lessons, because, you know, it's basically 20 chapters of dialogue in each of Job's friends dialogue, a lot of what they say is true. They're right about a lot of things. And this is the thing I mean, we talked about the importance of discernment of being able to pick out the true from the false, but each was a little bit off in some way. So like in the case of Eliphaz's first response, it was because he had had this deceiving spirit that literally visited him the night and told him that this is what the problem was and that this is why it was happening to Job. So that was, that was why the life house was off. So he was misled by wrong information. In the case of Zophar, it's probably because he had some preconceptions about Job and was thinking, oh, well, you had some, you know, underhanded things going on in your business dealings. This is why this has hit you. And then sometimes it was just because he didn't have the full picture. And so like with Bildad, um, I think that was the situation with him. Now, each of them kind of went off and they took Job's pushback a little bit personally. And so they themselves start like really falling into some personal, uh, they're responding out of personal offense. Like that's where it gets to. But where they were right, what they were saying was generally true, but it wasn't specifically true about Job, right? What the friends were highlighting to Job that could bring judgment, so um, it was what they were saying about that was absolutely true. So Eliphaz was saying that judgment could come because of personal sin. That's true. Bildad was suggesting that it could have been sin on the part of Job's family, and that's something that we in the West in modern times are a little uncomfortable with, but just read the Old Testament and really pay attention to what's going on and what's being said. And that's absolutely, absolutely true. And Zophar said it could be because of wrongdoings on the part of like uh, Job's business dealings or endeavors. That's what he thought the problem was. All of those things are true. All of those things are true. That can be true. But as we've discussed like so many times throughout this whole study, um, that not only are there consequences for wrongdoing, you know, on a part of either ourselves, but it can also be on the part of our family, our community. And we can be experiencing the impact of that unless and until we repent of that sin. And so 
This is what's known as identificational repentance. And there's some pretty heavy examples in the Old Testament about situations where sins had to be atoned for because of something done and it affected either an entire family, a tribe, or even an entire community. And that is in the Bible. We don't look at that and we don't really acknowledge that so much, but it is absolutely, it's absolutely true. And the other thing to remember is that sometimes we have our own idea of the world and the way it works. And between the Old Testament and today, the world hasn't changed as far as the laws of God, both spiritual and physical, and how it how it operates. What's changed is the cross and our way of atonement. So we don't have to make animal sacrifices anymore to cover sins. We don't have to put people to death for sins that can't be atoned for by animals. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the sacrifice he made on the cross that can, that can not only, it can wipe away the sins. They're gone when we through the blood of Jesus when we confess and repent to them, but they have to be confessed and repented of. And we, I think a lot of times in the West don't really, um, we have a shallow view of God, of the, the depth and this, of the seriousness of sin, the damage that it does. And when we don't understand the impact sin does, and we can't really, we can't really appreciate the sacrifice Jesus made. If we don't know how um, how dire our circumstances are, then we can't really appreciate the salvation that we have. So anyway, but anyway, going back to Job, Job pushes back on this. And he says, "No, I didn't sin. I didn't. I didn't do anything." And he calls on God to vindicate him, and he also calls on God. To like, if he's done anything wrong, to let him know, because he's like, I, I'm just at a loss here. I don't know. I don't. I have no idea what the deal is, and so he is so certain of not only God's justice and righteousness that he keeps pressing forward, right? And he's he's confident that God will vindicate him, and he's confident that he hasn't done anything, and that you know he's he's been righteous, right? So he's pushing through. So anyway, so part of the thing that makes the book of Job so complex, I think, I think that if we understand this, it makes it easier to understand. There's not just one object lesson. There's not, it's not just dealing with one situation. It's giving a perspective or giving us a perspective on uh, what's going on in the spiritual world. It's it's speaking to situations when we ourselves are going through a hard time. And then it also is speaking to us on uh, when we are on the outside looking in and seeing what is watching other people going through hard times. It's addressing like human motivation and our own failings. It's like it's highlighting through Job's friends how we can be judgmental and bitter and how we can have wrong ideas about people and take offense. And it also shows how through Job, because what happens is he kind of comes to a point, he's pushing back, he's going to God, but he's kind of come to the point at the end of this exchange between him and the friends where he's approaching the point where he is uh, judging God, thinking that God didn't do right by him. And when Elihu steps in, he stops him at this point. So anyway, that's, that's it, right? And so we have to, um, it's one of the things that, as I've been going through this, I've been in this since April, and um, that I haven't been able to, just to be honest, it's been some of the, going through some of the lessons, it, it's been a struggle to go through. And that is part of the reason um, there is so much to it because it's not just about Job. It's also for the friends. 
And so sometimes we're the friends and sometimes we're Job. But I think that what's important to remember that the book of Job can highlight to us is that um, when we are looking at, okay, what's going on here? Why did this happen to me? The dynamics are about more than just us, right? Job shows us that there are spiritual forces at our work in our lives that are out, you know, seeking to harm us. There's also interactions, unseen interactions that we don't know what are, that are impacting us. And like I've said, I think that in Job's case, it was probably, it was probably sent on the part of his children. That's, that's just what I think. But we don't know the whole circumstance. But what we have to do is we have to trust God that he is good and faithful. And whatever, whatever there is going on, there is a reason for it. We may not know what it is. And as we saw in the last two chapters, in or the last four chapters, when God was speaking to Job, God doesn't tell him what is going on. In the last four chapters, he's just saying, he's pointing out to Job the things that are in front of Job's face. He said, do you, can you explain this? Do you know how this works? Do you have any power or control over this? And if you don't, how can I possibly explain to you what's going on here? Because there's things going on that you just don't even understand. I used to do a, um, an event here in uh, my local community and we were doing an Easter event. And uh, somebody just called me up and just said, hey, I want to throw an egg hunt from the community. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, had no clue. Was fairly new to the community. My kids weren't even old enough to be able, you know, so I hadn't even been through any carnivals at, uh, you know, at school, no experience with it whatsoever. You know, project management I had done, you know, worked in, um, as a realtor, we worked with builders and we'd build houses. So like I knew project management, but it was like this particular thing, no experience with. And so I just kind of like, okay, what are the pieces that need to come together? And what is it that we need to do? Just kind of learned how to do it. The thing is that there were other events that were going on in the community and they were free. They were just open to everybody. They were great events. They were cool. Not knowing how it actually worked. So we just thought, oh wow, we're just going to put on an event and let's just see how this works. And there's just so many things, so many pieces that go into place. So there were two things that were going on at the time. One we had at our community town center, we had these really amazing events that would be going on. And we didn't know at the time that those events, you know, they would have vendors there and some small sponsors, but we didn't know that those events actually ran at a loss every year. And it was one person, one businessman that funded those. And he picked up the tab all the way through and that's how they, they continued to go on. We didn't know that. These are for these free events. We had another uh, shopping center that had just amazing, amazing uh, events at Easter and at Christmas. And the last time that they did one of those events, they had real snow, they had carriage rides, there was all this stuff. It was just tons of stuff. And it was all free, free for people who came. What almost no one knew was that it was a shopping center owners who set aside 10% of the rents of from their tenants and then they would give that to the tenants to put on these events so there is this expectation of how things are supposed to be how these free events are supposed to be when i when we started doing our event which was also free admission there would be every single year there would be people coming up to me saying uh where do we pay to get in and i'm like you're obviously not from here because people from here would not be saying that they would be complaining that you know, something didn't meet their expectation. And so after, as far as the shopping center, after that shopping center was sold, they didn't have it anymore because putting on events are a big deal, right? And so the, the uh, shopping center tenants, they tried to do it, but they didn't have the funding for it. And so th eventually they just, those things just went away. They didn't have it anymore. And so we've had these these great events, right? And we had one of them that was funded. It wasn't one that I did. It, 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 like mine, I gave it to another group because number one, we weren't getting we weren't getting uh, tickets sales, and 
so we would have to literally every year start from zero and fundraise to put on those events. And we only have very few volunteers. And even the people that said they, they would volunteer, you know, come up to the last minute and they would, you know, life would happen. They couldn't help. And so one time, one one year after recap, I was just talking and I was like, yeah, I was up to three o'clock. So I would try to like get everything you know, ready before we left. So when I got up in the morning, all I had to do was just, you know, stand there and be ready for whatever came because things would happen. Right. So everything had to be ready before I went to bed the night before. And this one guy who was kind of like, it's not really on the board, but he was like kind of an advisor. He's like, well, if you're up to three o'clock in the morning, you need more help. And I'm like, no joke. Yeah, I do. But that's just the way it is. But we would have people complaining, complaining about things that other event that we did, or I didn't do this, but the other event that was held there, we'd have a 4th of July uh, celebration and they would have, <laughs> they would have fireworks, people complaining about the fireworks. And it's like, your taxes don't pay for this. Your homeowner's fees don't pay for this, right? You have no idea what's going on here. You, you have no idea of everything that's involved to put this on. You don't know what you're even talking about. So until you do, maybe you better zip it. So either put up or shut up. That's kind of my, I, I'm just, I try not to say anything because I don't want to cause problems for these other event owners, but that's just the way it is. People talk about things that they have no idea what's going on, right? They don't know what's going on. And so this is what's, this is the same thing with Job. God's saying, you don't have a clue. You have no idea what's going on here. So maybe you just better zip it. That's what we, we studied last week when Job said, I'm covering my mouth. I'm not going to say anything else. And that is what we need to remember. We need to remember we don't know the deal. Okay? We don't, we don't know what's going on. So whatever happens to us, when we say this shouldn't have happened to me, we don't actually know, right? If, if your family, like people in your family from, you know, decades before had had something that you're experiencing the judgment on and you're saying this shouldn't happen to me but we don't don't say those things you don't know the situation right and so god is good and he wants good for us and we have to trust that and believe that and step forward in that and that's where job had come to the point where he was beginning to judge god he presents his case to god in chapters 26 through 31 and then the answer starts to come, right? The answer starts to come. Elihu shows up and he says, you're getting self-righteous. You're judging God. He is good. What happens is just. And who are you to know this? And not only does Elihu say that, you know, you need to check yourself, but Job had said in some of his dialogues with his friends, that God isn't going to do anything here in this lifetime. The hit, Job was certain that God would bring justice in the end, but he didn't trust God for justice today. He thought that Job's, Job thought his own problems were too big. He thought that he was too far gone, that God couldn't do anything about it. He thought that whatever, you know, these, these uh, people that we talked about this, like in the midway through the book, that it seems like there's, um, it's kind of a hidden condemnation of this, the powerful that were in the area that were going on without seemingly any check or against, you know, there's nothing that happened to them and Job is righteous and he's experiencing this calamity, right? So Job is saying, do you see them? Nothing's happening to them. People don't always get what, they're, what they deserve, and he's kind of come to a point where it's almost like he's saying that he's not necessarily going to bring justice to the situation, and Elihu's saying that there's nothing beyond God's power, and that he can bring justice today, and that these people that Job and his friends are saying just get away with, you know, all this wrong that they're doing, they're going to experience justice, or and that justice will come. And then God steps in in the last four chapters and he speaks himself from the whirlwind, right? And he's asking him, do you know what, do you know what's going on here? Do you know the deal? He's like, no, you don't. You don't know what's going on. 
you know, people are saying like, oh, why doesn't God like just tell us stuff? Would you be ready for whatever God has to say to you? Let's just say he showed up. Would you be ready? I don't think we would always. And we want to be ready, right? We want to be ready to hear what God has to say to us. And we were talking about this in um, my regular Bible study. Um, we were in Ezekiel. And I was thinking about all the major prophets. So that's uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, right? But God had a lot to say to them, right? And guess what? You can see as common among all those major prophets. They all started after God when they were young. Isaiah wasn't specifically called, but he was seeking after God. He heard God say, who shall we send? And Isaiah said, send me. And we have some of the most clear and profound prophecies in the Old Testament it came from a young person who was seeking after God. Jeremiah, young. God said, don't let them don't let them dissuade you because you're young. You just say what I tell you to say. Ezekiel, fiery, fiery, saw crazy, crazy visions, like these wild experiences, but he was someone who was open and receptive to it, right? And so he encountered God in a very dramatic way. And then Daniel, he sought after God. He was taken into captivity. There was all this pressure to conform, but he and his friends determined that they were going to honor God, regardless of their circumstances, right? And he was young, and God blessed him and his friends, gave them favor, and it wasn't only, you know, this is, I was just reading this recently, all of the, Daniel and his friends were blessed, but Daniel was, had um, particular wisdom, extraordinary wisdom, and I think it was because he came up with a plan and he led them in the path. You know, he was, there was a group, a small group, but he was the one that stood up. And so God particularly blessed him. But the common thing is that they were all young and they had a zeal for God. And that's what Elihu is in this. He is this young person who isn't even important enough that he deserves, isn't even mentioned in chapter two. Because Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar were the bigwigs, right? They were the important people that came. Elihu isn't mentioned, but he is the one who has the word of God. And he kind of opens the heart of Job. He is the one that speaks out, defending God's honor. And he kind of gives a check to Job. And you can think in a way that he opens the door to God speaking to Job. Because Job was established, right? He was, um, he was comfortable. He thought he knew who he was and, and what his position was. And then he's broken and all that's taken away from him. And God has to prepare him and he has to, you know, it's through this trial, through this process that Job really gets to a place where he's ready to listen to God He's ready to encounter him because you have to wonder if God just came to Job when he was in his comfort, had his wealth, would Job have heard him speak? I don't think so. I don't think he would have. He had to go through this. He had to go through this trial to be willing or to be in a place where he was ready to hear God. So Elihu has Job makes his complaint to God, Elihu comes and speaks to him, almost kind of sets his focus. He's almost like the, um, the convicting of the Holy Spirit almost, saying you're being self-righteous, you're judging God here. And then God comes and speaks to Job. He's asking Job, literally, what do you know? Job's like, I got nothing. I'm just going to close my mouth. Sometimes that's what we need to do. Just say, God, you're right. You're right in what you do. You're right in what you say. This is where we're at. So we are at 42, right? Chapter 42. I'm just going to read this. So verse one, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. 
So before chapter three, Job is starting out. It's like he thinks there's nothing left for him, for him, right? It's just time for him to lay down and die and God will deliver him in the afterlife. He has trust in the resurrection even then. But as far as this life, he thinks it's over. Then he, through all this, he gets stirred up. His spirit rises up and he starts pushing it back, you know, against his friends. And he's asking God, he's not even really asking God for deliverance. He's just asking God for vindication. Just say, say that I'm right here, God. Just tell me that I'm right. See, his thing is he wants to be proved that he's right. And that's what we talked about last week was that, you know, Job was still seeking after God, but was we can get a little bit off. Even when we think we're seeking after God is we're not seeking God's glory. We're, we just want to be right. And we have to be willing. That's the whole thing about repentance. Repentance is admitting as you're wrong. Turn around. Turn around and go the other direction. Admit you're wrong. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. We will flee and he will flee. But a lot of times we try to resist the devil without submitting to God first and recognizing that it's God that's right. We can be off on a lot of things. Even our motivations, our heart can be wrong and we won't even know it. We need the conviction of the Holy Spirit to show us where we're off. And that was the role that Elihu played in the book of Job. Okay. So Job is here saying, he's, he's changed his tune a little bit, right? He, and he's saying, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Anything God says, whatever it is, it will be done. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. This, who is this that hides counsel with, without knowledge? This is what God said to Job at the beginning of his dialogue to good Job. Okay, that's what God said to him. And Job is saying, repeating what God has asked him, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? And then he continues, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will make it known to me. This is another way that Job has changed a little bit because he's just thinking, who can go to God? Who can know? We can't know these things. And so not only is Job saying here, there's nothing too great for you, but not only that, that God will make it known to him, that God will in a, in interact with him and that he does want to be in relationship with him and that he will bring and he will let him know what the problem is, right? I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job is repenting of these, these wrong thoughts and attitudes that he's had towards God, even though they weren't, we may not think of them as major. Um, actually in the uh, divine comedy in the inferno, and when you look at the seven levels of hell, that it's actually the sins of the thought that are seen as more serious because those are sins against God Himself. And that's what Job is saying here I repent because I had these wrong ideas about you. So that's the be verses one through six. Job's repented for his wrong thoughts and attitudes. Then it continues. And the Lord addresses Job's friends. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and your two friends. So no, not Elihu. It's Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourself. And my servant Job shall pray for you, and I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So when we think about that and what they said, 
all three of them thought that they were honoring God in what they said, right? But they weren't. We have discussed a little bit about how certain things were off. But I think that that's something that we need to keep in mind is that when we speak wrongly about God, that that can bring judgment too, even if we think we're honoring him. And when you look at the second commandment, it's not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of people who are in Judaism or think that they're being Hebraic whatever. They don't say God's name. They don't say God or uh, they don't say Yahweh. They say Ad Adonai, Master. I have um, a Bible study about that. They won't write the word God. They put a dash in the word in, in place of the vowel because they don't want to blaspheme the name by mispronouncing it. That's not what it is. What it is is what we're seeing here. It's misrepresenting God. So it has nothing to do with pronunciation. Are you representing God correctly? And I think all of us who say we represent God, we need to take that seriously, right? Anyway, he tells them, you have not represented me correctly. You've spoken wrongly about me. He tells the three of them that they need to apologize to Job. So God is answering Job's prayer here for vindication, right? God is vindicating him. He's proving Job right and that he was right. He's he's answered Job's prayer in that way. He's telling them to ask Job for forgiveness, to repent, and to bring something. Because remember, Job has nothing that he could. He's he's completely destitute. He doesn't have anything to make an offering with. So God is telling the friends to bring seven bulls and seven rams. To make a burnt offering. To make atonement. God's providing the provision for the sacrifice. And so Job forgives them. He prays for them. And God accepted Job's prayer. So here's one thing that I think is important about this as we read the next thing. As I was in a um, prayer ministry. Prayed for people. Uh, pr primarily for healing. And the biggest thing that is usually the go-to. right? And, and I did see things that I think the blocks to healing had to do with generational issues. I do think that, but I'm not going to get into that now. But anyway, the biggest breakthroughs in healing came when we would ask the person, is the Holy Spirit bringing anyone to your mind that you need to forgive? And when they were able to do that, that is when we saw the breakthroughs in healing. So if you have a problem in an area and you have bitterness or resentment towards someone or something that happened to you, then ask God to highlight that to you. Because sometimes we're not even aware of what that is. And ask God to forgive them. Intercede for that person or that situation and ask God to forgive them. Because let's read what happens to Job after he makes a sacrifice and intercedes on the part of his friends. Okay. Verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. Directly tying it into this intercession for other people. Was Job praying for his own fortunes? No. He had been asking God. But it wasn't until he prayed for the friends that God restored his fortunes. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him. So this is just a kicker to me. Job's been through all this. He's there alone. Right? With people coming against him. He prays for his friends. God starts blessing him. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. I don't know what that says about the family. I don't know. Anyway, that's another discussion. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him and each of them Gave him a piece of money and a ring, ring of gold. <laughs> this is the beginning. So, Job gets vindication. He prays for his friends. And it says, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So, it sounds to me like, just from reading this, at least in this 
this translation. The, his fortunes were restored. Then, then the family came and they gave him more, right? They gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold, right? So then they came and the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. So it's this building a blessing, isn't it? So he was restored. Family came in. They gave him more things to work with. And he's blessed even more. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yokes of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. This is probably really uh, significant when you're in an agrarian culture. We have a hard time appreciating it, but it's a lot. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter, Jemima, and the name of the second, Kezia, and the name of the third, Karen Hapuk. And in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years, saw his sons and his son's sons four generations, and Job died an old man and full of days. So from chapter three, where Job thinks that there's nothing left in his life, other than nothing left for him, other than just to give up and die. This is the end. This is what J.R.L. Tolkien refers to as the eucatastrophe, the sudden good end, right? The surprising end. It's like a resurrection when all hope is lost. And that's who God is. Whatever our situation is, that's who we have to remember we're saying we have faith in. And Sometimes we think faith is just an idea or like a believing, but it's not just a believing, it's a doing. It's the difference between Moses, who when they were going to the promised land, they came to the Red Sea and they sat there and waited and God made the path, right? And then they started. But then faith is really Joshua, who they're coming up to not only the edge of the Jordan River, but they start stepping into it, believing that God will clear the path for them, and they continue on. That's faith. It's, as Donald Williams says in his book, 95 Theses for a New Reformation, faith is trust that commits. It's Abraham, when God told him, get up and go, take your, leave your family, and go to the land I will show you. Abraham didn't even know where he was going. He didn't know what the destination was. He just... Trust to God that it was going to be a good destination, that he would lead him and protect him in this going, right? He knew what the end was. He didn't know, like, the path to get there, everything that was going to happen in between time. He just got up and went. Faith is trusting and committing to going and walking forward and trusting that God will lead us on the path, provide the way as we go. That's, that's what faith is. So... Job already had it all and he had to lose it, right? To really know who God was. It says, as he says in this passage, I spoke without knowing and he had to learn the goodness of God. He had to decide and persist and seek after him in spite of everything that was in front of him. And in this last part, I think we're seeing that God is blessing him as he goes. So let me just end this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace to us. Give us a faith that is willing to commit, that ha that we can trust you for blessing us as we go. We thank you, Lord, for your good, good gifts to us. And I pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, I'll call the week. See you next time.